Uh, Nicole Redvers is a, an associate professor and director of the Indigenous Planetary Health at Schulich School of Medicine and Dentistry in the Western University of London, Ontario. She will give our opening keynote talk. Um, Dene Chani, um, The Path We Walk, Visions for Planetary Healing. Welcome. It's an, um, and it's an important week for me. It's been a tough uh, few weeks back in my home region where I'm from. 68% uh, of our population over the last three weeks was evacuated due to wildfires uh, within my region in the subarctic region of Canada. And just this past week, probably about half of those people were able to re return home. Uh, many of them, unfortunately, don't have homes to return to. So this topic is, is very much integral to our, our lived experience in, in many places around the world as Indigenous peoples. And because of that, because of the accountability that comes in relation to our lands, it's always important, of course, to position ourselves as peoples in connection with the lands that we come from to invoke the spirit of our ancestors in, not only as a form of placement, but as a form of accountability. My name is Nicole Redvers. I'm a member of the Deninukwe First Nation up in subarctic Canada. We were the, the not so smart Dene peoples that didn't come to the warmer weather. So we're kind of like the pale ones up north. <laughs> and uh, our, our land is called Nenede, land of the people. Treaty 8 territory, but we also have Treaty 11 up as well too. I was born and raised in my home region. My grandparents, my mother, my kids, my family, my relatives. It's just been such an honor and privilege to be able to be raised by such amazing people. Despite the difficulties, I am the first member of my family not to attend residential school with my mother and my grandmother being attendees. <laughs> I'm blessed right now to live on the traditional and lands of the Haudenosaunee, the Lenape, Chonaton, and Anishinaabek peoples in southwestern Ontario as a visitor from the north. It's important to note all of this, my indigenous ways of being, knowing, lived experience, really has been informed by tens of thousands of years of memories stored in my region's stories. So anything I say, anything I talk about, anything that I embody is not my own expertise. It is the experience of millennia of people from my home community and land and the people that I've been honored to live from. I like this quote from George Kajadi because it really speaks to me in terms of this interdependent connection with our stories from our homelands. Our culture's vitality is literally dependent on individuals in community with the natural world. Indigenous cultures are an extension of our stories, of our natural community, of our places, and evolve according to our ecological dynamics and natural relationships. Our indigenous methodologies stem from many components of our value systems, whether it's respect, reciprocity, responsibility, resurgence, humility, care, so many of these integral parts of our ways of life. And this idea of how we form our relationships is based fundamentally on this premise of interconnectedness, which is the embodiment of the title of the presentation today that I'll go into a little bit more further on. So how do you turn this interconnected relationship to land, land with a capital L, land as a relative, into a methodology for healing, into a methodology for our food systems, into a methodology for governance. Well, of course, there's always been a methodology in existence for thousands of years. It is the reason why we are here today. All of it's based on ceremonies, a critical act in reciprocity that comes from our foundational natural laws, sometimes called first laws, original laws. In my area, we call them Dene laws, which inform our traditional knowledges which are operationalized through our traditional protocols and how to live as 
individuals, families, and as communities through ceremony as a daily act of life. Now, why is it important for me to say this? The world has clearly changed. We've went from a square synthetic, we've went to a square and synthetic worldview from a circular and holistic worldview. We are in a time of change, and the experiences of my home region are the reality of that. My area is warming at three to four times the global rate, so climate impacts are happening and amplifying within our region. One of the reasons the wildfires have been so stubborn within our area is because normally we receive about 65 millimeters of rain. We've received less than five this year. So the wildfires are burning one meter below the ground. So that makes it very difficult for firefighters and our communities to be able to put them out. So how can we think about solutions? And I often invoke this word planetary health, even though it's a relative newcomer in the Western way of thinking about things. And it's often been done in a very human-centric or anthropocentric way. And I've been very much pushing to ensure a better holistic understanding of this term that comes from our communities, Mother Earth's health. In the Western way, planetary health is a solutions-oriented, transdisciplinary field and social movement focused on analyzing and addressing the impacts of human disruptions to Earth's natural systems on human health, but also all life on Earth. But when we think about an indigenous approach, planetary health as a field is primarily a Western construct as our indigenous traditional knowledges have absolutely no clear separation between ourselves and that of the planet. They're absolutely interconnected. So this means that the meaning and application of planetary health, of Mother Earth health, is directly rooted in community values based on our own traditional protocols for living in harmony with all that has existed for thousands of years, like a quilt with patches all spread across the earth. We have our own responsibilities in our regions to uphold, to ensure that that quilt stays together. So we can think about indigenous planetary health as being nested within interconnected knowledges around the world that's impacted from multi-directions at all time points. And the lens of the world has clearly changed, and we've seen this in many fields of scientific discipline and academic inquiry, and even application in our day-to-day -day life. We've went to a very anthropocentric or human-centric ego eye, where humans are assumed to be the top. Comparatively to this eco, this we, humans is just one small part of a greater ecosystem, of a greater planet. Now, thankfully, health equity considerations are becoming more common within our common discourse and communications, but what's often been left out is the idea of an interspecies equity approach. We are all interconnected with no hierarchy between us when it comes to how the natural systems operate. Now, I noted before about our natural first laws, original law, in my case, Dene laws, being the foundation of our understanding of existence, informing our indigenous traditional knowledges, operationalized through traditional protocols, so that we can have applications for good health with individuals, communities, and families. We have Earth-centered jurisprudence systems that govern both ourselves, but also nature as well. The sun will continue to rise, from the east and set in the west, the moon will continue to affect the tides, and our actions will continue to affect the earth. So in this vision for a healthy future, it's important to create the conditions, create the context that enables the overcoming of the dissonance between just being in nature as opposed to a part of it. 
One of the examples that I often give to scientists, to clinicians, is that many children start to learn that we are made up of 60% water. Our bodies are approximately 60% water, a little bit less depending on what gender you are. 60% water. It takes about three months for your cells to turn over in your body, on average, in most systems. So depending on where the water comes from, coming out of your tap, in the place that I live right now, we get our water from Lake Huron and Lake Erie. Back home, we get our water from Tucho, or Great Slave Lake. After three months of being in those areas, 60% of me becomes Tucho. 60% of me becomes that lake. Every single person in this room is a living embodiment of the rivers and lakes that they come from. So when I see everyone here today, it's not only human beings, it's a representation of the lakes and waters from around of the lands of where you come from. So if the water is sick, we are sick. If the water is healthy, we are healthy. We are walking around daily as rivers and lakes. We are completely interconnected. So ultimately, this idea of natural law, of first law, is a way of living on our lands, within our countries, within our nations, handed down through countless generations, sustaining this web of relationships, this understanding of fundamental interconnectedness at its most foundational base. And of course, indigenous traditional knowledges are really very much nested within these understandings of natural and first law. I think Elder David Kushir states this really well in terms of our current situation. And he says, working in alliance with nature and our natural laws is the key to ensuring our survival. The reason we have climate change is because we have broken natural laws. What is natural law and how can we find our balance again? The spirit in each of our beings carries moral and ethical principles of what should be the basis of our human conduct. We understand these moral principles as natural laws. Natural laws are innate to all living beings. They are invisible laws that govern all life. All living beings, including Mother Earth herself, are governed by natural laws, whether they know it or not. So why is this, again, important for me to state? And I, I think of the words of Chief Dan George, who was from the Sitsilewatu First Nation, who said, allow me to learn the ways of your book knowledge so that I might combine it with my natural knowledge and lead the way. We as Indigenous people understand very clearly the importance of the gift of multiple perspectives, the diversity of knowledges coming together to be able to bring a better understanding of the whole so we can tackle some of the greatest challenges of our time including things like the climate crisis. There's a term, and it's an academic term, it's called epistemological pluralism. Epistemological pluralism. That's kind of the Western way of saying the same thing. We need a diversity of knowledges to come together to be able to find the best path to move forward. I think of the words of Anne Polina, a good friend, and she often says, although Mother Earth is a living system that can transform and heal herself, she will be lonely without the vibrations of her human family. Now, the title for this talk included the concept of denechenya. Denechenya. And this essentially encaps encapsulates my people's way of life. In the simplest terms, Denechanya is the path we walk. And one of uh, my elders by the name of Francois Paulette, Denisulene elder, he lives in Treaty 8 territory. And he often teaches this concept, stating that our life is just one of billions of conglomerates of energy that exist on this beautiful planet. Just one. But each one of those living beings, those beings, has an ephemeral existence of spirit inside. 
Spirits take the form of action trails. That's the word he'll use. Spirit takes the form of action trails. And I think about that. What does he mean? What does Elder Paulette mean by our spirit is made up of action trails? And for me, what that means is that our actions create the spirit of who we are. But not only that, our beliefs create projections for the future, which is kind of like our ideas of prayer. Because when you translate prayer into many of our languages, it's not in the sense of a, a, a Christian way. It's like a cry to the spirit for something to happen in the future. These beliefs are a projection forward. These prayers are a projection forward. Now, as we interact with other beings, it creates knots in the spirit world, points of interconnection within the spirit world every time we interact with another living being. Which means we're almost like a cobweb with all of these intersecting points all over, connected in some way, shape, or form. And I'll often describe indigenous planetary health to folks to say, if you think about a spider web and you pull on it, everything comes with it. Now, for our spirit to live in harmony, we need to have a dynamic balance between our systems. Of course, there are many teachings, whether or not it's the medicine wheel or otherwise, we don't have medicine wheel in my region. Mind, body, spirit, physical components being in a dynamic balance. But what's important from the teachings of Denachanya is sometimes it's actually the suffering that gets us on the path to Denachanya, the path we walk. So because of that, Denachanya is fluid. The path is fluid. It's based on the building up of our actions and our projections towards the future, whether they're positive or negative. Because of this, we need to ensure that our actions and our projections forward are in a way that are aligned with Mother Earth, with our families, with our communities, and with all other beings on the planet. So how do these concepts apply to food? This on the screen here is chokeberry. Not choke cherry, chokeberry. It's different for some folks that live in the Dakotas. Maybe you've heard of this food before. It grows around the Great Lakes here in Minnesota, but also in many of the other states, and including in Canada as well. It's an incredibly potent food medicine. Let's take a little journey through chokeberry, embodied by the concepts of Derechanya. If we consider this plant at an ecological level, it is incredibly resilient. It's able to survive in different soils, with varying pHs, with soil moisture levels, with different landscapes. In fact, it's so resilient that it can live in some of the wettest soils by creating structure in the soils to prevent it from breaking down and eroding. It also is so strong that it can create windbreaks so that it protects other plants, other animals, other small insects. It acts as a protective barrier, as a source of resilience to the landscape around. It's so resistant that the berries can survive in the wintertime for hungry birds and animals that may be struggling if the fall harvest and production wasn't satisfying their needs to make it through the winter. It embodies the protective and nourishment in so many ways. But if we consider the energetic, the physiological components of this berry, 
down to the mere particles, the atoms that make up this berry, moving on to its genes, not our blue genes, but the genes, the souls, the blood memory that exists within this plant. All the way up to the full form berry with its chemical components, including anthocyanins, which is one of the most potent antioxidants on the planet. And in fact, on a physiological level, consuming this berry acts as an anti-inflammatory, a hypoglycemic, something that lowers blood sugar, antiviral, antihypertensive, lowers blood pressure. There's so many components to this berry at the physiological level. But what's amazing is that when we consume this berry, our knots in the spirit world combine because we're interacting now with another being. Our knots in the spirit world combine. And those amazing properties start to become part of us. We've just recently finished up one of the first, I hate calling it clinical trials because NIH likes to do that for our foods. But we just finished a trial where we gave participants, indigenous participants, chokeberry juice for six weeks. And one of the amazing things at the output of this study was that we were able to demonstrate for the first time one of our traditional foods actually stopped an inflammation process at the epigenetic level. We can't change our genes, but we can change the expression of our genes. And I was so tired of always hearing about how trauma and all of these negative things can affect our genetic expression and be passed down to generations. What about our medicines? What about our foods? What about our ceremonies that can also be passed down? And what inspired me to, to do this study was an elder by the name of Bessa Blondin. She's one of our last remaining medicine women in our area. And she'd often talk. And afterwards, she'd, she'd do this moment, this movement after her ceremonies. And she'd go like this. And she would say, things would switch. Things have switched. And I kept thinking about that. And I thought, OK, well, if we're thinking about the physical paradigm, what's the smallest we can go on impacts? It's at our gene level. So how can this affect the expression of our genes utilizing our traditional foods? And they do. When we sing to our medicine and food plants, like chokeberry, we bring in the universe and, our, and understandings of Dinechenya, but then we actually turn them back out to the cosmos. By consuming our traditional foods, we create spirit knots within our body, places of interconnection that embodies and becomes us. Just as that 60% of us is made of the lakes and rivers that are around us, so is the rest of us made from the food and the components of the food that we eat. The interconnectedness takes on new meaning when we think about foods in this interconnected way. But I want to take a moment to highlight here the importance of being able to scale in and scale broad and go back again. Our indigenous ceremonies and knowledges are amazing at doing this. Western science has a hard time of doing this scaling in and scaling out. But if you think about our ceremonies, even in regards to food, it's invoking the small all the way to the, the, the biggest and the, and the middle levels of the universe all in one. Indigenous peoples do this brilliantly and have a lot of te to teach in this area. As we see land as an extension of ourselves, the fundamental components of our understandings of natural law bring teachings to the world to bring us back to an interconnected place. I use the term land in an all-compassing way, though, not just the earth beneath our feet, but being inclusive of the water, the air, the rocks, the medicines, everything. Land, an all-encompassing term with a capital L denoted gr grammatically through a strength-based approach. It's not just land with an L, a geographic place. It's a land, something we have a relationship with, something that teaches us and we learn from, something that, that can accept our grief. I'll never forget the moment when we had a, a, an elder 
who had had a very difficult time during residential schools and who had been on the street for decades. And he came to an urban land-based healing camp that we have running in our home region of Yellowknife for the last six years. And the elder had come and said, don't worry about sharing your grief here. When you're ready, just go, go over there, go on the land. Let, let the earth take your tears. Land is us, us is land. Being able to envision the deep interconnectivity of our existence, these braided patterns all the way up from our blood systems to the way that our lungs are intertwined inside our chests, to the braided rivers, trees, branches, watersheds, rivers, global bird migrations, all in these patterns of interconnectedness, all tied up in these knots in the spirit world, the spider web. Now I want to broaden out one more time. A few years ago, a group of, of indigenous scholars, land defenders, elders, knowledge holders came together around the globe to define what we wanted to call the determinants of planetary health. We often sometimes hear of the social determinants of health, the things that affect us, the places we live, how we grow, our jobs, those types of things. But what was missing in that dialogue was what about Mother Earth? Why can't she be put in the middle for once to say what needs to happen to make her well? What needs to happen to make her well? So we went through a process it was a beautiful process of ceremony, of reciprocity, of sharing amongst nations around the world. And there was a number of determinants that we came up with as a group. I want to just highlight two of these here now. The first is the human interconnectedness within nature, not with nature as a separate entity within nature. And we premised very clearly that ecological demise point to an impaired human relationship with its inner self because humans are nature and not a part of it. We have evidence of the loss of an ecologically or land-bound cultural identity. And this disconnect from nature as a broader society manifests as a fragmented and dissociated identity that cannot recognize itself as part of a system making it easier to project predatory and abusive impulses onto the environment. Thus, this ideology of independence has resulted in a sense of entitled ownership, a kind of perception of the natural world that relates to it through transactional relationships that do not have a sense of responsibility, care, or love. And this worldview will only continue to perpetuate planetary harm. The other less appreciated determinant of health that we premised very strongly was indigenous people's health. We premised very strongly in our group that of course the health being intrinsically tied to the health of indigenous peoples. Indigenous peoples currently host and steward 80% of the remaining biodiversity on the planet, yet make up 6% of the global population. We steward one third of the remaining old growth forests on the planet. We host and steward the majority of the languages left on the planet that host and contain blueprints of ecological knowledge around the world. When indigenous peoples have their land, their food, their culture, their sovereignty, they're more likely to continue stewarding the 80% of the remaining biodiversity that exists on the planet. Because of this, Indigenous people's health needs to be approached from a holistic standpoint, not only in the sense of our own community well-being, but also for planetary well-being. Our food systems are automatically bound up in all of these determinants of planetary health in one way, shape, or form. We concluded our paper stating that Indigenous voices are a powerful and beneficial solutions oriented force for Mother Earth's well-being and for all living beings that inhabit her. We therefore call for an inclusion of wisdom that is not mere knowledge or information, but is an insight that comes from the heart, from the heart of Mother Earth. 
I often state that we cannot solve complex problems from the same worldview that created it in the first place. We cannot solve complex problems from the same worldview that created it in the first place. We cannot solve complex problems from the same worldview that created them in the first place. <laughs> this speaks to the need of epistemological pluralism in the Western way, or the gift of multiple perspectives, which was brought forth very clearly by Elder Albert Marshall, Mi'kmaq Elder, who described two-eyed scene. But a lot of folks think of two-eyed scene and its application of the generalities of the uh, definition, which is given as one eye, looking through the world, looking through our knowledges, looking through solutions from a Western way, using the other eye to look through problems, solutions through an indigenous way, and to look through both eyes together. Two-eyed scene, gift of multiple perspectives. What's often underappreciated in Albert Marshall's teachings is that really it's not about a binary. And in fact, the root of the word, as taught by Elder, is that it came from a time when all of our communities were living in nations in close proximity to us. And the gift that we have of being able to honor others' knowledges, honor others' creation stories, honor others' protocols, honor other people's ways as a gift the ability to accept diversity as its ultimate premise. And we know very clearly from ecosystem science that a diversity in our, in our ecosystems, diversity and biodiversity is important. But we often don't think about that in knowledge systems. We also need an, a diversity of knowledge systems to be able to get through our colliding crisis that we have today in the complexity of the current issues that we face, our food systems will play a role. We need to embrace diversity in all forms. So what do I hope to see in university spaces and governance spaces and around food systems? We really need to go from one way of knowing to ecologies of knowledge hierarchical structural practices to communities of practice, disconnection to reconnection, fear to wonder and awe, universities to pluriversities, anthropocentric, human-centric to ecocentric, despair to hope, domination to participation, hegemony to inclusivity, me to we, knowledge transmission to relational care, We need to embody aspects of understanding seen through compassion, through concepts like Dene Chania that we all have within our nations in different ways, shapes, and forms, with a deep appreciation for the cycles of learning that are inherent with our, in our community pedagogies, in our community learning styles, in the ways that we knowledge gather around the fires, around the kuliks, in the lodges, all of these places, compassion, knowledge, reflection. But even more so, embedding understandings of multiple scales of influence in our food systems and how our food systems operate in the health of people, communities, and planets. Cycles of learning embodied the mul multiple scales of influence. I want to share a quote from one of my dear sister's research on land-based healing in the Canadian North, where one of the elders shared that land-based is one of those words. It's a beautiful, wonderful term. It's bringing people back to the land and helping them become alive and remembering their humanity and their connection to all living things. We are the land. So if we remember who we are, then the same miracle that we see all around us will be us. Indigenous knowledges remind us in how to walk in the world in a good way. Danachanya. And the path we hopefully decide to walk is together with Mother Earth, in whatever capacity that may be. You cannot understand true medicine power 
in whatever capacity that may be, unless you have an understanding of the nature of things. To understand the nature of things, you need to be in nature. You need to connect to the animals, the rocks, the stars, the winds. We often have stories about our people, but also our medicines coming from the stars. One of our most powerful medicines that we have up north is said to come from star people. And what I always found my most interesting about all of these aspects and in invoking again, bringing back that idea, the symbolism of our bodies, the reality, the physiological reality of our bodies being 60% rivers and lakes from wherever we come from, wherever we, are, we reside. But the understandings that our bones, our teeth, all of the structural minerals that are in our body at this moment were all, every single one of them, was minerals that were created in long exploded stars. Physiologically, we are star people. It is not just a spiritual, mental, com emotional connection. We are physiologically star people embodied within all of us. So these kinds of interconnections can be so powerful if we really think about the deep essence of who we are. Who we are as people, star people, water people, and how our foods interact with these components. Now, I want to say Masi Cho. And a lot of people in my region actually think, so Masi is thank you. Cho, a lot of people interpret as being big, like a big thank you. So Masi Cho Cho, big, big thank you. But I was taught by Elder Roy Fabian that no, originally this was actually not how this word was conceived. Because if you go to my home region, a lot of our big things are called like this. Dei Cho is the name of the Mackenzie River, one of the longest, biggest rivers in the world. Dei Cho, Great Slave Lake, where I'm from, where I grew up on the shores of Tu Cho, big river, big lake. But Cho ultimately is, is actually an honor word. It's an honor word. So we place Cho on the end of anything to bring honor to the space. So it's not big river, it's honor river. It's not big lake, it's honor lake. It's not big thank you, it's an honor thank you. So I wanna say Masi Cho. I hope that some of these reflections you'll carry with you and embody them in your own ways. And I also wanna thank you for the time and attention today as well. It's given me a lot of strength to be here despite some hard weeks in the past, and I know a lot of my relatives in my home region would appreciate your prayers for rain and for a lot of the conditions to change for the wildfires back home. Masi Cho. Thank you, Nicole. Just such beautiful wisdom and words and just aspirations, right, everyone? It's very heartfelt. Thank you for that. Mm -hmm. So just before we're going to go on break, um, if you have a question for Nicole, we're going to go ahead and look at the pigeonhole and see if there are any questions coming up. So Nicole, let's see what's, what are some questions, some comments. Great job with chokeberry study. What do you mean by change? Mm. How can that be proven? Yep, absolutely. Genetically. So mm -hmm. I'm not a bench scientist. I'm a clinician by training, but I've been into research spaces for a while. But I was so pleased to have uh, a Dakota uh, lab technician who is based at the USDA, who uh, is an expert at doing a lot of the epigenetic analysis. So what happens now is uh, a lot of the modern science, and this is where we can blend a little bit of the old knowledge and the new knowledge, is able to do basically a, a blood test at the beginning of the onset of our chokeberry juice study to assess uh, the expression of our genes. So not our genes, not our genetic, but how they express. And then after the period of six weeks of juice consumption, another blood test is done, and they're able to now assess the expression of those genes to see if anything's changed between them. I was very much interested in the inflammatory pathways because I just had a hunch. It was an expensive hunch but it was a hunch. <laughs> and many of the inflammatory pathways were not affected, but one main one was. Um, and that's how we were able to um, assess or 
prove, so to speak, the change um, with the genetic expression of the genes. Thank you. Another question? Are there examples of successfully granting legal personhood for ancestors? Yes. Uh, so there's been a lot of um, success around the world. In fact, there's a couple of success stories here in the United States, which some, with some uh, rivers gaining personhood. But I would say the, the most um, um, known examples are in New Zealand. Uh, there's actually a legal law that's in place for the rivers there. Australia has one. Uh, Bolivia and Ecuador have been really at the front lead to this. A couple rivers in the United States. Uh, they've had a number of in B Bangladesh recently as well. So the rights of nature movements thank thankfully are increasing, but they need to increase more in my opinion. And also Manuman wild yes, rice. Uh, yeah, yes, absolutely. Thank you. And next question? Let's see. It looks like we got to pick one. Okay, are there plans to do more studies with other traditional foods? Well, I'll tell you one of the motivations for this food study, because in my humble opinion, we don't need to prove anything. We know our medicines work, we know, we know, our, food, we know our foods work. It, it's as simple as that. The problem was is that we had a lot of communities uh, that were interested in changing the kinds of foods that were presented in the USDA food boxes. But of course, government agencies usually look for evidence, so to speak. So one of the motivations for this study wasn't necessarily to prove anything. It was actually to demonstrate the importance of how our foods can have health impacts with the hopes of providing more funding to communities to integrate uh, regenerative berry programs or food programs or incorporating more traditional foods into the USDA programs. Thank you for that. But no, no plans for other studies at this moment, although I have heard some communities interested in looking at buffalo. <laughs>